Yes, should the mitral valve, valve close or not? Uh, give me one second. Okay, I apologize. Now let's begin. Just making sure that this gets recorded. So let's 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 come back. During systole, the left ventricle should contract. When the left ventricle contracts, the mitral valve should close. If the mitral valve closes, then all the blood will go through this way. Now, in a case during systole of the left ventricle, if the mitral valve fails to close. Right, if the mitral valve fails to close, will the blood go back to the left atria? The answer is yes. Then again, the blood will come back, and this there will be creation of a turbulence. There will be creation of a turbulence. So, having said that, if during the systolic phase we hear uh, sound in the left fifth intercostal space. So a systolic sound, we a systolic murmur heard at the left fifth intercostal space indicates what problem with the mitral valve, mitral regurgitation or stenosis. Okay, it indicates mitral regurgitation. As simple as that. Another one. Another one is, let's talk about another situation. Let's talk about another situation. That is, let's talk about the diastolic phase, right? The phase of diastole. What do we expect? That in diastole, blood will easily flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Yes or no? Is that what, is that what we expect? that during diastole, the blood will flow easily from the left atria to the left ventricle. So during diastole, if there is a stenosis of the mitral valve, can the blood flow easily from the left atrium to the left ventricle? The answer is, the answer is no. As a result, blood will once again be turbulent. So, at the left fifth intercostal space, if we hear a diastolic murmur, what does this indicate? This indicates mitral stenosis. <laughs> in the same way, instead of the left fifth intercostal space, if I talk about the left third intercostal space along the sternal border, which valvular uh, abnormality am I talking about with this location? This is the location of the is the location of what? Tricuspid area, this area, right? Same way, during systole, when the right ventricle contracts, if we hear a sound, what does this indicate? Tricuspid stenosis or tricuspid regurgitation? Tricuspid regurgitation. During diastole, if we hear a sound, what does this indicate? Tricuspid stenosis or tricuspid regurgitation? Tricuspid stenosis. So it's the same thing. Okay, it's the exact same thing. So let's start talking about, okay. Let's talk about um, this one. Let's talk about uh, aortic and, and pulmonary valve abnormalities. First, let's consider the um, left second intercostal space. So which area am I talking about? The left second intercostal space? left second intercostal space of talking about the pulmonic area very good okay so now this patient do you have a patient in this patient the blood flow is happening from the right atria to the right ventricle and when the right ventricle contracts the tricuspid valve will close yes or no fast answers please the tricuspid valves will close and 
all the all the valve all the blood would move in this direction for example while moving through this direction if we have a stenosis of the pulmonic area will there be creation of a turbulent blood flow yes so a systolic murmur at the left second intercostal space is a representation of which abnormality pulmonary stenosis okay same way during diastole right same way during diastole at the left second intercostal space okay during diastole at the left second intercostal space for example when the left ventricle uh, relaxes the tricuspid valve will open or close the tricuspid valve will open and blood will start flowing from the um the blood will start flowing from the right atria to the right ventricle and when blood starts to flow from the right atria to the right ventricle during diastole the pulmonic valve should be closed or not yes or no the pulmonic valve should be closed or not yes the pulmonic valve should be closed. <laughs> so if instead of being closed let's say the pulmonic valve over here is regurgitated meaning that it is not being able to close properly. It's something like this. Okay. So during diastole, will there be turbulence in the pulmonic area and blood will try to leave? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So in the left second intercostal space during diastole, if we hear a murmur, what does this indicate? Pulmonary regurgitation. Same way in the right second intercostal space, second intercostal space, if we hear um, a sound, right? If we hear a sound during the systolic phase, what does that indicate? Very good. In the same way in the right second intercostal space, if we hear a sound during the diastolic, Phase, what does that indicate? Regurgitation. Okay. So one more time, in the mitral area, if we hear a, if we hear a systolic murmur, what is the valvular abnormality? That senses, please. Very good. If we hear a uh, diastolic murmur, what is the valvular abnormality? Okay. In the aortic and pulmonary area, if we hear the if you if we hear a systolic murmur, what is the abnormality? <coughs> if we hear diastolic murmur, what is the abnormality? Okay. Very good. So that's basically what it is. Now let's go forward. Now, um, there are a couple of things over here um, which you need to see. For example, as you can see over here, they have mentioned all the causes. Um, please try to remember that these causes are very, very important. So in the mitral area, as we just said, in the systolic murmur, when there's a systolic murmur, we hear mitral regurgitation. So there are two types of systolic murmur. One is systolic, another one is hollow systolic. What does the word hollow mean? Hollow means that the sound is higher, that it's overlapping. Do you know what, what overlapping sound is? Overlapping sound is that when you cannot differentiate properly, whether the, whether the systolic murmur is, um, I mean, it will overlap uh the first heart sound so much that the first heart, heart sound will not hear will not be able to uh, i mean you will not be a, you will not be able to hear it out properly so it will hear i mean it will sound as if um there is a loud bump you know for example when a lot of water comes and hits a surface they create a large sound 
And that's exactly what you would hear. So that's, that's what we mean by hollow systolic murmur. If it's a systolic murmur, it's a mitral valve prolapse, which is more or less the same thing as mitral regurgitation. Uh, basically, mitral valve prolapse is um, ballooning of the mitral valve into the left atrium. And if it snaps open, then the valve can get regurgitated. So mitral valve prolapse is, for example, the valvular abnormality that can lead to mitral regurgitation, but it, uh, the valve is not regurgitated as of yet. So it will also create a same sound that during systole, if the valve prolapses, right, then you will also hear a systolic sound. Diastolic murmur is for mitral stenosis, so that's it. Tricuspid area, same thing. If it's a hollow systolic murmur, it's regurgitation. And if it's a diastolic murmur, it's stenosis. Another thing is that in the tricuspid area, we hear VSDs, right, in young children. For example, <laughs> in young children, right, this is their heart. This is the interatrial septum. This is the interventricular septum, right? And there is a defect of the, of the ventricles. There is a defect of the ventricles. So when the left ventricle contracts, when the left ventricle contracts, blood will flow from this way. Yes or no? This movement of blood from this one to from this side to this side will create a hollow systolic sound that will be best heard at the left third interfossal space along the sternal border, that is at the tricuspid area. Okay. Sometimes this sound can also be heard in the mitral area, more or less. So basically in, in the lower segments of the heart. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay. Okay. So that's it. There's another thing I want to talk about very quickly. Um, that during pregnancy, do we have increase of blood volume? Yes or no? During pregnancy, do we have increase of blood volume? The answer is yes, okay? So this increase of blood volume will increase the stroke volume, yes or no? So when the stroke volume is increased, the amount of blood that's leaving the heart will be increased, yes or no? The answer is yes. So when the blood, so, so when a lot of blood flows out of the left ventricle and goes to the aorta, it will flow, there will be a very high flow of blood. But this flow, will it be turbulent or laminar? The answer is it will be a laminar flow. There is no turbulence. But have you guys ever heard a lot of water passing through a pipe? Is there a, is there a sound like this, right? Right. This, this type of sound, if you ever hear, especially in the aortic area, this represents flow murmur. Meaning that this represents that either the patient has a lot of, uh, this either represents that the patient has a lot of uh, blood, number one, or it represents that the blood is very thin. For example, in some anemic cases, you can hear flow murmur. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, so this is flow murmur. Okay, so that's that. Um, another one is, I'm going to repeat the ventricular septal defect one more time. In ventricular septal defect, what happens? First of all, when there is a VSD, always always remember this. I'm going to explain this again when I talk about cyanotic and asynotic heart disease. The right side, left side, when there's a VSD, the blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle, from the right, from the right ventricle. Uh, blood will flow from the right atrium to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, when the right ventricle contracts, blood will go from the right ventricle to the left ventricle. Yes or no? At one point, blood will keep on moving in this direction, right? So, but the pressure of the left ventricle is higher than the pressure of the right ventricle. So at one point, will the shunt stop moving like this and reverse like this? Yes or no? Yes? So when blood starts moving like this now, from the left ventricle to the right ventricle, we hear a systolic sound. We call this a hollow systolic murmur, and we hear this at the tricuspid area. Are we clear? Yes? No. 
Is everyone clear about the heart signs or not? Okay, let's start talking about the next thing over here. If you understand the heart sounds, then and only then will you understand the maneuver. Did you understand the heart sounds or not? Which one? That's answers. Okay. Now let's start talking about maneuvers. Very, very important and high yield for step one and step two sequence. What do we mean by maneuvers? There are certain movements and there are certain positions that uh, you can ask your patient to take or you can ask your patient to do that will either increase the heart sound or decrease the heart sound. Especially what type of a sound? Increase the murmur, abnormal heart sound, or decrease the murmur. Are we clear? For example, if we hear a murmur of mitral regurgitation and we're not sure if the patient really has mitral regurgitation or not, then there are certain movements in the body that, uh, I mean, there are certain uh, movements that we can ask the patient to do, or there are certain changes that we can ask the patient to do that can increase the turbulence of the blood inside the heart, and it will allow us to hear the sound better. Okay, so having said that, let's start talking about some maneuvers. First and foremost, let's start talking about uh, maneuvers that will uh, increase your afterload. Are we clear? Let's start talking about maneuvers that will increase your afterload. For example, what do we have to do to increase our afterload? By increasing afterload, we mean that we have to do things or something needs to change in the body in order for the total peripheral resistance to increase. Yes or no? Fast answers, please. <laughs> Okay, this is the blood leaving the blood boundary. For example, if you squeeze your hands very quickly, uh, very tightly, hand grip, right? For example, you grip your hands very tightly, right? Now, when you compare this hand with this hand. The blood vessels in this hand, are they relaxed? The answer is yes. The blood vessels in this hand, <laughs> are they relaxed? The answer is no. Why? Because when you are gripping your hands like this, you are constricting your blood vessels. If you constrict your blood vessels, especially in the hands, are you going to increase the afterload? The answer is yes. So if you increase the afterload over here, when blood tries to move out from the left ventricle all the way outside to the aorta, will it face difficulty? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So over here, uh, for example, now let's say that um, patients have regurgitation aortic regurgitations and mitral regurgitations, okay? So if someone is increasing the afterload already with regurgitant valves, we have, a pop, we have a problem with backflow, that there's increased backflow. Right now, when the pressure over here is so high, is this high, will the, will the backflow of blood increase or will the backflow of blood decrease? Fast answer, please the backflow of blood increase. So if the backflow of blood increases, will the turbulence increase or will the turbulence decrease? The turbulence will increase. If the turbulence increases, what would happen to the murmur? Would it be high or will it be low? The murmur is going to be high, yes? So in hand grip, in a hand grip maneuver, what type of murmur? <laughs> What, what type of uh, murmurs will um, increase? I mean, which the sounds of which murmurs will increase? Especially most left-sided murmurs, their sounds are going to increase. For example, mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, and ventricular septal defects. 
Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Next one. Let's let's talk about another another one. Okay. Um, let's start talking about this one. Okay. Another one is. Okay. Okay. Now, um, if we have another sort of a maneuver that increases the preload, okay? So I'll talk about all the maneuvers that increase or decrease preload. For example, let's say that we have another maneuver that is increasing your preload. Um, if the preload increases, the blood flow back to the heart is going to increase or decrease? the blood flow back to the heart is going to increase. Yes? So if the blood flow coming back to the heart is increasing and we have problems with valves, for example, over here, we have a problem with this valve, we have a problem with this valve, and we have a defect over here. So the, the turbulence is going to be high or low? <laughs> the turbulence is going to be high. Yes or no? Because more blood coming in, what does this indicate? When more blood comes in, this indicates that, um, when, when more blood comes in, what does this indicate? This indicates that over here, you will have, um, the blood will have difficulty going out, especially when the valves are re regurgitated. Yes or no? So that's that. So basically what I'm trying to say is whenever there's a regurgitated valve, increase or decrease of afterload is going to increase the murmur. Okay, are we clear? Increase or decrease of afterload is going to is going to increase the murmur. Now, um, what are some of the maneuvers that will increase preload? Okay, did you guys understand the increase of preload and the in increase of intensity of the murmurs? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. So what are some of the maneuvers that will increase your preload? Meaning that what are some of the movements or things which we can do to increase the flow of blood back to the heart? First and foremost, <clears throat> the number one thing that you can do is increase preload means increase of venous return, right? So how, or how will you have increase of venous return? Increase of venous return is going to happen. For example, if you, if you raise your leg up, leg raise, that's number one. Okay, if you raise your leg up, that's number one. Number two, squatting. If you squat down, if you squat down, all the blood vessels in the legs, are they going to constrict? Yes, or no? Right, if, if they constrict, uh, will the blood flow back from the legs to the, uh, to, to the heart, yes or no? Yes, okay, so squatting. Next one is when you inspire or when you take a deep breath, are you expanding your lungs? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So when you're expanding your lungs, the intrathoracic cavity pressure decreases, so more blood flows back. Yes, so inspiration. Okay. Are we clear, yes or no? All of this increase of preload will increase the mitral regurgitation, uh, aortic regurgitation, and um, ventricular septal de defect murmurs, yes or no? Are they going to increase the intensity of these murmurs? The answer is yes. Okay, similarly, uh, similarly, you can also think about fluid administration, um, blood resuscitation or whatever, anything that increases the preload. Let's talk about increase of afterload. If afterload increases, will the murmur of regurgitant valves increase or decrease? The answer is, if afterload increases, the, the murmurs will increase. So what are some of the ways that you can increase your afterload? Number one is hand grip. 
number two is squatting again. Because as I said, when you squat, most of the blood vessels in your body, they constrict. So not only do we have increased blood flowing back to the heart, we also have difficulty in getting the blood out. Yes, so that's it. So in, in, when, when a patient squats, there is increase preload and increase of afterload. Are we clear? So squatting. What else do we have that can increase the uh, afterload? For example, basically, if there's any drugs or if there's any sort of obstruction that is preventing the blood from leaving the heart, so that's it. So when afterload increases, will we have turbulence of the blood? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Now, um, similarly, since we have understood uh, the problem with valves and the regurgitations and everything else, okay, let's talk about let's talk about another condition. This is something which you have to understand. So there is a very high yield disease and you will get a lot of questions regarding this disease in your years and step one. That is um, over here. The, this disease is an autosomal dominant disease, basically meaning that if any one of the parents have the gene for this disease, then 50% possibility of this uh, gene being passed to the next generation that they'll also have the disease. What is the problem with this? The problem with this is that there is a mutation in a, in a sarcomere protein that results in irregular septal thickening. The interventricular septum is irregularly thickened. Thickening of the interventricular septum like this. And when the interventricular septum thickens like this, what happens is you have the valve over here they sort of pull on the valve. They pull the valve this way. So when they pull the valve this way, they are basically obstructing the flow of the blood from the left ventricle outside to the aorta. <laughs> are we clear? Yes? Okay. As a result, blood when the left ventricle contracts, either the blood can flow back or the blood will, will have difficulty flowing out. This disease is called hokum. Or we, we, we say that this is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophy for irregular hypertrophy of the septal wall, obstruction because of systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve because the irregular septa pulls on the mitral valve like this. So there's an obstruction to the flow of blood out. And as a result, there is a development of a cardiac muscle pathology, which we say cardiac myopathy. What is the pathology? That the left ventricle, they start to get thickened. So multiple problems start happening at the same time. As a result, in a patient with long-term hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, the left ventricular cavity size is going to increase or decrease? The answer is it's going to decrease. Why? Because not only do we have irregular thickening of the interventricular septum, we also have anterior motions of the mitral valve, and we also have thickening of the left ventricular valve. So the cavity size, this is the cavity size, this is how the cavity size will look like in long term, right? This is how the cavity size will look like in long term. Now, my next question to you guys is, um, in these patients, how about, okay, uh, in these patients, try to think of it this way, that the problem is irregular thickening of the septal wall, right? The problem is the irregular thickening with the septal wall and uh, anterior motion of the mitral valve. In these patients, would they benefit more from less blood in the ventricular cavity or will they benefit more from more blood in the ventricular cavity? Let me explain this. If a patient of Hocum, if a patient of Hocum has less blood in the ventricular cavity for any reason, 
isn't there more obstruction, meaning that if, it, if there's less blood, there is less expansion, yes? If there is less expansion, then the, ventric the ventricles, they're not expanding more. As a result, the cavity size of the left ventricle is not increasing. And also due to the fact that if it expands less, it will also contract less. If it contracts less, and on top of that, you have an obstruction, then patients will have less blood flowing out of the heart. Are we clear? If less blood flows out of the heart, less blood goes to the brain. And when less blood goes to the brain, patients get syncope or hypoxic damage to the brain, as simple as that, hypoxic brain damage. That's why whenever we have a patient of Hocum, if they start, if they start to sweat a lot, if they get dehydrated a lot, what would happen to the amount of blood in the ventricular cavity? Will it increase or will it decrease? The amount of blood in the ventricular cavity will decrease. If it decreases, then what happens? Then the obstruction is increased. Yes or no? Then the obstruction is increased. And with increase of obstruction, why is the obstruction, why is the obstruction increased when the patient sweats or when the patient gets dehydrated? Because when the patient sweats and the patient gets dehydrated, less blood is available in the ventricular cavity to expand. As a result, the left ventricular cavity size remains small. On top of that, if there is less blood in the left ventricle, there is less expansion, meaning that there's less contractility. So as a result, the uh, patients, um, they will have less blood output. And then once again, less blood will go to the brain and syncope and hypoxic brain damage and that's it. So, my next question to you guys is, um, if there is a patient who has hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, and let's say that the patient is, especially in a young adult patient, right? Let's say young adult to a late, late adolescent. So I would say anywhere from the age of 16 to 30. Um, these patients, they're completely oblivious to the fact that they have a heart problem, <clears throat> right? And especially these patients, they're athletes, right? So because the signs symptoms, they appear, especially when the patients are uh, performing some sort of a sport or something else. So when they're performing a sport, are they getting dehydrated? Are they sweating? Yes or no? Fast answer speed. The answer is yes. So less blood is available in the left ventricular cavity. As a result, the left ventricular expansion is less. And due to less expansion, we have less contraction, increase of obstruction, less blood flow, less blood going to the brain, syncope, hypoxic brain damage. That's why the clinical scenario we see is that of a patient who comes to the ER with cardiac arrest. The patient was normal all of a sudden during, uh, some, sort of, during some sort of a game, a football game, a soccer game, the young adult patient, they collapsed and they died on the field. What is the most common reason? The most common reason is hokum, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Okay, now, if you, uh, let me talk about this very quickly over here. Now, if you know that someone has hokum, are you going to make sure that the patient has a lot of blood in the left ventricle at all times? Yes or no? The answer is yes, because you know, if there's a lot of blood in the left ventricle, the expansion of the left ventricle will prevent the obstruction, yes? they will prevent the left ventricular obstruction. So that's that. Another thing is that um, these patients, they need to undergo some sort of, uh, I mean, the most confirmative treatment for HOCOM is a heart transplantation or a cardiac transplantation. But there's another thing that is in HOCOM, you have to advise the patient to stay away from, um, stay away from sports that are basically going to dehydrate them, right? And uh, what you will do is, if I give these patients, if I give them beta blockers, if I, if I give them beta blockers, will the heart rate increase or decrease? Fast answers, please. The answer is that heart rate will decrease. If heart rate decreases, will we get more time for diastole? Meaning that will we get more time for blood to fill the left ventricle? Yes or no? The answer is yes. If the blood fills with more, vent, uh, with more blood during diastole, will it prevent the obstruction? The answer is yes. So first line treatment for HOCOM is beta blocker. 
And for any reason whatsoever, do you realize when the left ventricle cannot get the blood out uh, of the cavity, there is a possibility that there could be initiation of arrhythmia, especially ventricular arrhythmia, yes or no, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. This is exactly why patients die. They die of sudden cardiac arrest, right? They die of sudden cardiac arrest. And the sudden cardiac arrest takes place because the ventricular, because the ventricle cannot push the blood out. For example, let's say that you are stuck in a room, right? Let's say you're stuck in a room and you cannot push the door down. Are you going to freak out? Yes or no? The answer is yes. The same way when the left, when the ventricles cannot get the blood out, when the ventricles, they cannot get the blood out, they start freaking out and they contracting and they start contracting in a disorganized fashion that we call as ventricular fibrillation and patients get sudden cardiac arrest. So to prevent this, the first line treatment is beta blocker. The second line treatment is ventricular defibrillator, defibrillators that we place. There are machines, ventricular defibrillating machines that detects ventricular defibrillation, I mean ventricular fibrillation, and it gives strong impulses to the ventricles to prevent the defibrillation. Are we clear, yes or no? The answer is yes, okay. Okay, so why am I talking about this right now? The reason I'm talking about Hocum is in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, there's also a murmur because there's a there is a turbulent blood flow. So the thing is, uh, in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, any maneuver, any maneuver that will increase blood flow to the heart, will it increase the murmur or decrease the murmur? Fast answers, please. Any maneuver that increases the blood flow to the murmur, uh, my apologies, any maneuver that increases the blood flow, what will that do? Okay, let me explain why and you guys, your confusion will be gone, okay? This is the heart of Hocum. Irregular thickening, left ventricular hypertrophy, and anterior motion of the mitral valve. This is the only way that blood can flow out. If there's a lot of blood in this sort of a hokum heart, the left ventricle will expand, right? As a result, if the left ventricle expands, now we ha you have more space for the left ventricle to accumulate the blood. As a result, will the turbulent increase or will the turbulent decrease? Fast answers, please. Increase or decrease when there's more space the turbulent will decrease. If the turbulent decreases, what would happen to the intensity of the murmur? Will it, it, will it increase or decrease? The murmur will decrease. So for example, if there is a patient, okay, one more thing very quickly. Um, one more thing is um, if we do any murmurs, right? If we do any murmurs that decreases blood flow, okay? If we do any murmurs that decreases blood flow to the heart, for example, any murmurs that decreases um, your blood flow back to the heart. Now, will the left ventricular cavity expand with less blood? The answer is, if there's less blood flow, will the left ventricular cavity expand? The answer is no. If the left ventricular cavity, if it does not expand, will there be less space or more space? There will be less space. If there is less space, what would happen to the turbulence? Will it increase or will it decrease? The turbulence will increase. So any, so any maneuver that uh, decreases blood flow will increase the murmur of hokum. Yes, very good. And any maneuver that increases blood flow to the heart of hokum will decrease the murmur. 
Are we clear? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. okay. So <clears throat> um, let's talk about this. Let's talk about the maneuvers. Please clear your mind and give me the right answer. Think about this very properly. Okay. Let's think about the maneuvers. Number one is do you guys know what the Valsalva maneuver is? The Valsalva maneuver is when we take a deep breath in, right? Okay, this is the patient, nose, mouth. Okay, this is the lungs. This is the vocal cord or the glottis. When we take a deep breath in, right? And we close the glottis, and we push down on our abdomen, that is by the help of the diaphragm. Are we um, increasing the pressure over here inside the, inside the thoracic cavity, yes or no? Okay, when do we do this sort of maneuvers? Physiologically, Valsalva maneuvers, we usually do this when we're trying to push something, right? When we're trying to push something out. For example, uh, during uh, defecation, right? When we pass feces, if there's, if, if there's constipation, we have straining defecation. During that, what do we do? We try to make sure that we, that we press down on our intestines, right? And if you think about how we press down on our intestines, we take a deep breath, we hold it in our lungs, then we close the glottis, this expands or contracts the diaphragm. This creates a pressure in the intestines. This allows the constipated feces to move down or bear down. Okay. Do you guys understand the Valsalva maneuver now? Yes or no? Okay. This is the Valsalva maneuver. So in the Valsalva maneuver, when we are doing this, especially when, when we are straining, we are increasing the uh, intrathoracic pressure as a result. If the intrathoracic pressure increases, will blood flow back to the heart easily or will there be decreased blood flow? Fast answer, please. There will be decreased blood flow. So are you saying that, that the preload is going to decrease? Yes or no? Yes. Now, if preload decreases, what would happen to the murmur of aortic regurgitation, what would happen to the murmur of mitral regurgitation and ventricular septal defect? And ventricular septal defect. Very good. The murmur will decrease. Why? Because the murmur will decrease. Why? Because less blood is flowing back to the heart. As a result, there will be, in terms of regurgitation, there will be less blood regurgitating back into the previous cavity. As a result, turbulence is going to be low and murmur intensity is going to be low, as simple as that. But what would happen in a patient of Hocum? Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. If there is less blood flowing in, is the obstruction increasing? Yes or no? The obstruction, is it increasing? If there's less blood, the answer is yes. So murmur intensity, will it be high or will it be low? Okay, so vice versa, if you increase preload, for example, if we increase preload by how? By leg raise, leg raise, squatting, um, <laughs> fluids, right? What would happen to the murmur of hokum? High or low? It will be low. But now what would happen to the murmurs of mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, and ventricular septal defect? High or low? They will be high. Okay. Okay. One last thing. If a patient of Hocum, okay, let's say this is the cavity of Hocum, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. First problem, 
irregular, septo, thickening. <laughs> Second problem, left ventricular, hypertrophy. Third problem, systolic, anterior motion of the mitral valve. Okay. Now, in these patients, if the afterload over here, okay, this is the aorta. If the afterload is high, increase of afterload, will blood flow out easily? Pass chances, please. No. So if the afterload is high, the blood will not flow out easily. So as a result, will more blood stay back in the left ventricle? Yes. If more blood stays back in the left ventricle, is the left ventricle going to expand? Yes or no? If the left ventricle expands, the obstruction will increase or decrease? Decrease. If the obstruction decreases, the turbulence increases or decreases? Decreases. If the turbulence decreases, murmur increases or decreases? Decreases. So, uh, are you saying that if there is a maneuver that is increasing the astral load, for example, in squatting, hand grip, right? Are you increasing the murmur of hokum or decreasing the murmur of hokum? <coughs> Excuse me, decreasing. But what are you doing to the murmurs of MR, AR, and VSD? Increase. Okay. And with that, we are done with the discussion of maneuvers. Extremely high yield. Please put your star marks for this one. Extremely, extremely high yield. So what I'm going to, going to do is I will give you guys five minutes. Read the maneuvers. Read the maneuvers, read the changes, and read the increase and decrease of murmurs. I'm right over here. I'll ask you questions, then I'll move forward. Is that clear? Yes or no? Okay. Thank you so much. So five minutes on the clock. Please read the maneuvers. Okay, are we done? Yes or no? No. Valsalva maneuver, is it going to increase the murmur of uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? Yes or no? Okay, okay. Leg raise, is it going to increase the murmur of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? Squatting, will it increase the murmur of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? Hand grip, will it increase the, obstra, the, the murmur? 
dehydration will it increase the murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy blood loss will it increase the murmur of cardiomyopathy hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy okay less venous return to the heart will it increase the um, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy yeah so you guys get the idea okay so let's move forward let's let's move forward to heart murmurs so heart murmurs over here <clears throat> what type of murmurs do we have and what are some other things so the way that you have to do this, okay, the way that you have to do this is I'm going to give you homework for this one. First and foremost, since we are on the topic of homework, how many of us have completed the homework from yesterday? Okay. Is there anyone who has done the homework? You have done, okay, Dr. Ellen, very good. Who else? Okay, so we have only one student out of 15 students in the class who has done the homework. So is there anyone, is there no one else? Okay, Dr. V, thank you so much. Who else? Okay. Um, if you guys are not doing your homeworks, <clears throat> then please try to remember that your study topics and materials will keep on st storing up. And at one point, you will have, you will be overwhelmed with the amount of information you have to retain later. So today, if I give you a homework for heart murmurs, are you going to do the homework or not? Because if you do not do the homework, then uh, there's no point in talking about this. Yes, guys. Yes, okay, thank you so much. Now, the reason why I want, I need you guys to do this as a homework because we don't have enough time in the class to cover uh, the things. The, the homework which I want to give you is that what you do, for example, when you are home, okay, First thing first, in your US Assembly step one question, are you guys aware that you have to wear, um, you have to wear headphones, yes or no? So there are two types of headphones. One is a noise canceling headphone. Another one is a headphone, basically that's there to help you listen to sounds. One of the highest yield sounds that you'll hear in your headphones are the sounds of murmurs. So if you hear the sounds of murmurs in the exam hall, do you have to hear the sounds of the murmurs before in your practice exams to make sure that you identify the sounds properly? The answer is yes, right? So um, there's actually no way I can make you hear the sounds except that what you can do at home, all you have to do is everything is available. So you go to YouTube, right? And you write down aortic stenosis sound. and you will hear the sound. If there's an emboss sound, then that's amazing. So it will be something like this. Okay, look. So in your US assembly step one, you will, get a, you will get a simulation like this. Do you remember at the beginning of the lecture, I said that you have to take your mouse and you have to press that you have to place the stethoscope on the positions, yes or no? And do you remember how I told you that you, don't, you do not have to remember the uh, spaces because they will be designated? So this is how they will be designated like this, mitral, tricuspid, pulmonic, aortic, and then the, then the carotids. So you have to hear the sounds in different positions. So from here, for example, you have to move the cursor up to here, then hear the sound at, in this region, and then at this region, and then finally at this region. So you hear the sound at all of these regions, and then you try to identify what sort of a sound is this. Now, if you hear, obviously, if you hear a systolic murmur in the aortic area, what is the valvular abnormality? The valvular abnormality is aortic stenosis. If you hear a systolic sound at the mitral area, what is the valvular abnormality? The valvular abnormality is mitral regurgitation, right? So this is how you have to make sense of all of these things. But in order for you to understand whether the sound is a systolic sound or a diastolic sound, in order for you to do that, do you have to listen to the sounds in YouTube? Yes or no? The answer is, the answer is yes. Okay. Have I made myself clear? So number one, what is the homework for today? Okay, I'll give you guys only one homework so that you do not get overwhelmed and you do not do the homework. 
all you have to do is take some time off and listen to the murmurs in YouTube. Are we clear? Okay, let's start talking about the first murmur, aortic stenosis. Aortic stenotic murmur is a crescendo, meaning rise, and decrescendo, meaning fall, type of a murmur. Okay, it's so this is so this is that type of a murmur. The thing with aortic stenosis is over here, please underline the following things. The first thing is that aortic stenosis murmur will always radiate to the keratids, right? They will radiate to the keratids. This is going to be present in your question stem because, uh, of course, since the aortic valve is in the uh, area, of, I mean, it's in the ascending aorta, we know blood from the ascending aorta goes to the arch of aorta. From the arch of aorta, they go to the left common keratin, left subcapian, and the brachiocephalic trunk. In the brachiocephalic trunk, you have the right common keratin, and then, you have, and then on the other side, you have the left common keratin. With these two keratins, they go all the way up to the brain, right? So they will radiate to the keratids. Remember this. Next one is that aortic stenotic murmurs will have, will have this condition that we call pulsus parvus et tardis. This means that the pulse are going to be weak. And this makes sense. Why will there be a weak pulse? There will be weak pulse because over here, the heart is having a difficulty. Is, the heart is having a difficult time pushing the blood out. Yes or no? The answer is yes. If the heart has a difficult time pushing the blood out through aortic stenosis, the blood pressing on the blood vessels that we hear the pulse. Do, do we hear the pulse in the blood vessels? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So, um, over here, if, if there is less blood flowing out of the heart, will the blood push more on the blood vessels or push less on the blood vessels? The answer is they will push less on the blood on the blood vessels. As a, as a result, do we hear strong pulses or weak pulses? We hear, we hear weak pulses. So this weak pulse with a delayed peak, right? Weak pulse with a delayed peak, this is known as pulses parvus et tardis. You have to remember this. And most of the questions of aortic stenosis are basically about uh, old patients who have dystrophic calcifications of the valve or senile degenerations of the valve for which there is, there is stenosis. So patients are usually about the age of 60 years. And in your even in your question, these, these will be old patients. And patients have a constellation of sign symptoms that is called SAD sign symptoms. SAD stands for Syncope, angina, dyspnea. Syncope means uh, the patient will lose consciousness because less blood will flow to the heart, to the brain. Angina because of hypoxia and uh, dyspnea because of uh, blood accumulation in the lungs. Why will blood accumulate in the lungs? If there's aortic stenosis, there will be backflow of the blood from the left ventricle to the left atrium, from the left atrium to the pulmonary blood vessel, and that's how the blood will accumulate. So patients will have a constellation of sad sign symptoms. Okay, are we clear, yes or no? Next one is mitral regurgitation. What type of a sound will you hear for mitral regurgitation? You'll hear a sound that is a hollow systolic murmur, right? A hollow systolic sound. And we all know where we will hear the sound. We will hear this at the mitral area. And will there be a radiation? The answer is yes. They will radiate towards the axilla, very high yield. Okay, mitral sounds will always radiate towards the axilla. Uh, over here, um, another thing, mitral regurgitation. Do you remember when I talked about myocardial ischemia, I said patients can get uh, mitral regurgitation. Why? Because of myocardial ischemia, there will be less blood flow to the corda tendini and the valves will get weak. If the valves get weak, can they regurgitate back, yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. So will you hear uh, in a patient of myocardial infarction, is there a possibility that we will hear a uh, systolic murmur or diastolic murmur? You will hear a systolic murmur. Very good. If we hear systolic murmur, then this will indicate that this is a patient of who has had re recent myocardial infarction. That's that. It's not all the time, only when there's mitral regurgitation, we will hear systolic murmur in myocardial ischemia. Okay, so mitral valve prolapse. What sort of a sound are we going to hear for mitral valve prolapse? Once again, we will hear a systolic sound. 
okay? And it's best heard over the apex, we know this. It's loudest just before A2. And over here in mitral valve prolapse, uh, um, over here, you need to remember, if you, if you ever get a patient of mitral valve prolapse, what does this mean? This means that this is the heart, this is the valve, and the valve is ballooning up like this. If the valve, if the valve balloons up like this, does this indicate this, that this valve has increased elastic features? Yes or no? Increase of elasticity? Yes, meaning that it's not stiff. It's not as stiff as a normal valve should be. It's more elastic. So you need to consider some conditions where other connective tissues in the bodies are also pretty elastic-like. For example, Marfan syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, very high yield. Marfan syndrome is a disease where we have abnormal of the fibrillin gene, FBN1, I'll talk about this, and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is a connective tissue disorder where we have a genetic defect of col one a3 and col one a5 okay so we'll, i'll talk about these things later but in these conditions there is excessive stretching of the body tissues and mitral valve prolapse is very common in these patients and once again rheum rheumatic fever is high yield for every valvular problem so i'm not mentioning this because it's that common rheumatic fever especially what type of patients will get rheumatic fever patients who are coming from uh a, a, a developing country, right? Basically, they, they will get rheumatic fevers because over there, the prevalence of rheumatic fever is very, very high. Are we clear? Yes or no? Next one is ventricular septal defect. What sort of a sound are we going to hear for a ventricular septal defect? We will hear a harsh autosystolic sound, which I mentioned already. That's that. Diastolic sounds. What type of diastolic sounds are we going to hear? We usually do not hear uh, pulmonary regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation as much, but so we will stick to uh, aortic and mitral stenosis in, in terms of diastolic sounds. Diastolic sound is the sound that will happen. Diastolic murmur is the abnormal sound that will happen during the phase of diastolic, where the heart will try to relax and uh, blood will try to flow in. So aortic regurgitation, you will hear a high-pitched, blowing, early diastolic decrescendo sound, right? You do not have to remember the, um, you do not have to remember this, but if you can, US Assembly Step 1 uses this exact word, high-pitched, blowing, early diastolic decrescendo murmur. And patients who, in this, uh, in the developed world, patients who get um, aortic regurgitation more commonly, if you can remember this, please try to remember that patients with a syphilitic heart disease, right? Patients who have syphilis, especially cardiosyphilis, they have a bark tree appearance of the aorta. And in developed world, for example, in US, we know that in US, the prevalence of sexual transmitted disease is higher than uh, some, more, deve some uh, more developing countries. Right, so syphilis is known to cause early diastolic murmur, uh, aortic regurgitation. That's that. Okay, and over here, if the patients they will get wide pulse pressure, the pulse pressure is going to be wide, and then we hear another thing that is in aortic regurgitation. Can you guys answer me this? The amount of blood that will be flowing out of the heart will it be high or will it be low? The amount of blood that will be flowing out of the heart is going to be high or low? High, right? Why? Because the regurgitation will allow more blood to flow back to the left ventricle. The left ventricle will contract. As a result, stroke volume will increase and more blood will flow out. If more blood flows out, um, there is this thing. Have you guys heard of this? I think you guys have. This is called head bobbing, right? The head bobs when you, when there is, when there is um, basically some sort of, uh, uh, regurgitation. Let me show you the quick picture of this one. Okay, let me show you a quick picture. Head bobbing. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, look, look at this. Look at the movement of his head with each pulse in an amplified video. Wait one second. Okay, focus on this one second video. Do you see the movement of his head? Yes or no? <clears throat> yes. This is the sort of video that you, I mean, this is the sort of head bobbing that you'll see. It, it's usually more exaggerated. It's not as simple as this. Let me see if I can find a better video. Uh, they must excite. There we go. Do you see the head bobbing like a little bit? Yes or no? Yes. No. Okay. So that's that. Are we clear, everyone, about the head bobbing? Let's move forward to mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis, the, the sound will be a diastolic sound. And uh, during diastole, what happens? This is the heart. During diastole, blood will try to move out from the left atrium to the left ventricle. When it does this, if there's a stenotic mitral valve, it will face some obstruction. At one point, if the valve opens and the blood goes from the atrium to the ventricles, will there be an opening snap? Yes or no? Will there be an opening snap? The answer is yes, okay. So mitral stenosis, there will be an opening snap followed by um, abrupt motion. There'll be a mid to late diastolic murmur, and that's that. But basically just try to remember diastolic murmur, as simple as that. If you cannot remember a lot of things, try to remember diastolic murmur at the mitral region, followed by an opening snap, that's that. Okay. Uh, if there's a patient who has long-term mitral stenosis, can they get Ortner syndrome? First answer, please. Can they get Ortner syndrome? Yes. If there's a patient with long-term mitral stenosis, can they get a pulmonary hypertension? Yes or no? Yes, okay, very good. Okay, let's move on to the next one. That is PDA or patent ductus arteriosus. That is patency of the ductus arteriosus that allows the blood to move from the systemic circulation in, uh, in, uh, in, in your fetal circulation, right? So that's it. So if there's a patient who has, uh, continue, who has PDA, there will be a continuous murmur, machine-like murmur. This is very different from uh, the systolic and diastolic murmurs. Basically, this murmur will overlap both the heart sounds, the first heart sound and the second heart sound. Uh, there's no way I can explain you this murmur until and unless you hear the sound. So please make sure that you hear the sound of this murmur. And this is very heavily tested in your step one exam, the, the patent doctor's IT assessment. Okay, are we clear everyone, yes or no? Okay, so let's take a small break. After that, let's come back. And today we're gonna to finish physiology. Okay, and tomorrow we will begin pathology. Uh, let's take a break for 15 minutes. It's 11.22. Uh, let's meet back at 11.35 to 11.40. Uh, before you guys go, quick question. Are you guys understanding the lecture? Yes or no? Are you guys understanding the lecture? Yes or no? Yeah, okay. Okay, good. So let's take a break for 15 minutes. Let's come back and let's understand myocardial action potentials. Thank you so much.
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Yes or no? Okay, so did we have a nice long break? What did you guys do during your break time? What do you guys usually do during your break time? Eat? Okay, good. Okay. Push ups. Smart. <clears throat> okay, Dr. Fidel, very, very smart. Yeah, I'm sure you're doing them because you want to make sure that your blood flow to the brain is uh, good so that right after the break, uh, you would understand the topics in first sleep better. Yes? Is, is that the reason, Dr. Fidel? Very good. Smart. Hey, Dr. Ethar, feed my kids. Very good. Okay, good. So uh, till now, we are understanding the text and... Uh, Right now, we will jump into myocardial action potential. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Okay. No. When we talk about this, when we talk about myocardial action potential and pacemaker action potential, we have to realize that these are two different things. First and foremost. Okay. Let me draw this over here. Okay, this is, what is this? Okay. This is just a baby, but this is your heart. Okay. Oh. What's happening over here? So over here, we have two types of action potentials that's working, first and foremost. We have uh, the pacemaker action potential, which we have the SA node, AD node, and then the rest of the electrical conduit circuit here. So we need to understand how that circuit is working, number one. And number two, we have to understand another sort of uh, action potential. That is, how is the action potential of the myocardium taking place? So that's one. So over here, Let's talk about the myocardial action potential first. In the myocardial action potential, that is the action potential of the, uh, for example, the ventricular walls and uh, the atrial walls, they contract under the influence of blood. They contract under the influence of electricity. Blood, blood supply is basically going to come from the coronary artery supply. The electrical supply is basically coming from the uh, cardiac conduit circuit. <clears throat> and then again, this electric uh, conduit circuit and everything else can increase or decrease based on the influence of, can anyone tell me, based on the influence of which nervous system? Automatic or autonomic nervous system, yes or no? They can either increase the force of contraction in sympathetic and decrease the force of contraction in parasympathetic. Okay. So what's happening over here? First and foremost, let's talk about the movement. Number one, let's let's start talking about the ventricular action potential from the time when there's absolutely no contraction. When there's absolutely no contraction, the heart stays in a resting potential. We say that the resting potential is around this. That is negative 85 millivolt, <clears throat> right? Then all of a sudden the heart gets the blood flow, the heart, I mean, the ventricular muscle gets the blood flow and the ventricular muscle gets the signal to contract. So when there is the signal, the first signal that comes, what happens? The first signal that comes, we have the initiation of what we call as phase zero. So in phase zero, what's happening? In phase zero, we have a rapid influx of, I mean, we, we basically have a, a rapid rise of the voltage from the negative to almost towards the positive. And so in order for this to happen, in order for this to happen, what needs to work? For example, if, if I'm saying that the negative will become positive, 
Is this um, because of an opening of a channel? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So which channel opens in phase zero? The answer is in phase zero, the voltage gated in phase zero, the voltage gated sodium channels will open. Okay. So what happens when the voltage gated sodium channels open? When the, when the voltage gated sodium channels, when they open, we have a sudden influx. Yes, we have a sudden influx of sodium that's coming in. When a sudden influx of sodium comes in and sodium is positively charged, will it take the voltage up from the negative all the way to the positive, yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, so it moves all the way up and right when it moves all the way up, right after when it hits zero, after zero, what do we call this phase? This is the phase of B polarization. Are we clear? So phase zero is the um, phase of rapid depolarization and rapid influx. Are we clear about phase zero? Yes or no? Okay, then let's talk about the next phase. In the next phase, what happens? They reach a maximum potential, especially the voltage, they reach a maximum potential. And then there is another phase over here, this phase, where this phase is basically movement into this direction. So this blue line, this blue line, what does this indicate? Does this indicate uh, that the voltage is now decreasing? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So this is phase one. In phase one, what's happening? In phase one, the voltage gated sodium channels will open or close? They will close. There's inactivation of the sodium channel. So the sodium channels close, but sodium channel close, but there's another channel that stays open, that, that opens up. That channel is the potassium channel. And potassium channel, we know that the potassium, they have the tendency to move out. Why do potassiums move out? We know that in uh, when, when we do labs, the normal serum potassium is 3.5 to 5, yes or no? And the sodium is 135 to 145, right? That means that this is the amount of the potassium outside of a cell. If this is the amount of potassium <clears throat> outside, uh, uh, outside of a cell, right? So are we saying that the potassium concentration outside of a cell is low and the potassium concentration inside the cell is high? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So whenever potassium channel opens, will potassium leave the cell or, or enter the cell? They will leave the cell. So that's that. So that's why whenever you open a sodium channel, due to the high amount of sodium outside, sodium will always come in and potassium will always leave, as simple as that. So you close the sodium channel and you open the potassium channel and then you get this phase of repolarization, right? Then what happens is when uh, the sodium channels, when they, when they decrease, I mean, when the voltage, they, they decrease, right? Up to this level, what happens? Up to this level, when it comes to here, we have the opening of um, another channel. Can anyone tell me what is the name of this channel? The name of this channel is, the name of this channel is, okay, this is phase two. This is the opening of the calcium channels. So what's happening? Calcium channels open, calcium enters the cell, and we know what calcium does, right? When calcium enters, calcium tries to enter the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When the calcium tries to enter the sarcoplasmic reticulum, does it push out more calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, something we say as calcium induced calcium release? The answer is yes. So as a result, calcium starts to increase and potassium starts to leave. So these two things, do they cancel each other out, leaving and entering, yes or no? As a result, we get this stage of, can anyone say, can anyone tell me the name of this stage? This is, a, this is the stage of, plateau, okay, very simple. Then what happens? Then it goes on like this for quite a while. And then, okay, and then what happens at this point, <clears throat> at this point, what happens? We have the rapid fall like this. Now, can anyone tell me why there's this rapid fall in the purple line? This is phase three. Why do we have the rapid fall? In rapid fall, what happens? 
the calcium channels, they close and the potassium channel stays open. So potassium leaves rapidly. Okay, so potassium, they leave the channel rapidly. Are we clear? And then there is this phase. This phase is phase four, the last phase, phase four. Phase four is when more or less all the potassium channels have left and they go back to the, uh, they are trying to reach back to the resting potential. Okay, so in this phase, is the potassium channel still open? The answer is the potassium channels are still open because the potassiums are still leaving the cell. So at this point, we can expect that, for example, at this point in the cell, we can expect that the potassium level inside the cell and outside the cell are more or less the same. Are we clear? Since they're the same, they go back very negatively and they try to go back to the resting membrane potential. Okay, this is the phase of, this purple line is the phase of rapid repolarization and this stage is the stage of reaching the membrane potential. So one more time, the normal resting potential of the ventricular cardiac muscle is what? Negative 85 millivolt. Then all of a sudden in phase zero, what happens? There is an opening of the sodium channels. Sodium channels, they come in rapidly. And then what happens? Sodium channel close, potassium channel opens. The, the potassium starts to fall at this level. Calcium channels open and potassium channels are also open. So they cancel each other out. At this portion, calcium channels close, sodium channels open. Sodium abruptly leaves the cell. And then at one point, the level of sodium outside the cell and inside the cell are the same and they cancel each other out. So they, so they come back to the resting membrane potential. <clears throat> are we clear, yes or no? <clears throat> yes. Everyone. Okay, so what, how does this sort of uh, graph or, or how does this sort of an action potential help the ventricle? So when blood comes in, into the ventricle, the, 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 uh, the blood comes in, in, in the ventricle, the ventricles, will they contract? Yes or no? The answer, fast answer is please. We, we, we don't have a lot of time. We want to finish physiology. The answer is yes. So this is the phase of ventricular contraction, right? The, the ventricle is contracting in the green line. And then after that, the ventricle, does it slow down the contraction in the blue line? Fast answers, please. Yes or no? Yes, the ventricles are slowing down their contraction in the blue line. How and why? How? Because sodium channels are closing. And then at this level, okay, at this level, when the, when the calcium enters the cell, when the calcium enters the cell, there's another contraction that tries to make sure that the all the blood leaves the ventricle. And then after that, in this phase of rapid repolarization, is the is the ventricle um, is the ventricle sort of uh, taking time to reap uh, to fill up with blood again? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. And then after that, this whole cycle repeats one more time. Isn't it easy? Yes or no? Easy or not easy? Easy or not easy? Okay. Thank God for someone who said easy. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Desmin, Dr. Ellen. Everyone else, not easy. Phase four again. Phase four is the resting membrane potential where the potassium inside the cell and outside the cell are the same. Okay, I'll repeat this information one more time. Let me just finish uh, the next one. Then I'll repeat this another one. This one that I wanna talk about is I wanna talk about uh, pacemaker action potential. Okay, I wanna talk about pacemaker action potential. Okay, what is the pacemaker action potential? First and foremost, um, is this the action potential that takes place in the ventricular muscles, yes or no? No. Where does this action potential take place? Does this take place in the cardiac electric conduit? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So these are the things that are happening in the nodes. It occurs in the SA nodes and it occurs in the AV nodes. Now, this one, okay, this one is a little bit different. I'm going to tell you how. First and foremost, they start like this. Okay. They start like this. This is the fact that they start from phase four. So they start from, they start from the late phase, okay? 
So how do they start from the late phase and from where do they start? The thing is that they start near minus 60 millivolt, meaning that the resting membrane potential is minus 60. Very quickly, let me ask you a quick question. If a resting membrane potential is minus 60 and the ventricular resting membrane potential is minus 85, which one will be easier to depolarize? Fast answers, please. 60, of course, right? And that makes sense. Why? Because do we need the pacemaker to be more active than the, vent than the ventricular muscles? The answer is yes, right? We need the pacemaker to be more active. So that's why do not forget that the pacemaker resting membrane potential is more than the resting membrane potential of the ventricular cardiac muscle. And all of a sudden, there's a sudden rise of the resting membrane potential towards the positive part. And why do we, and how do we get this? We get this because of a very funny, okay, very funny sodium channel. Do you guys know why this is called a funny sodium channel? <clears throat> Do you guys know why? It, the answer is very simple because the scientist who discovered this sodium channel, he decided to name it funny, as simple as that. Very simple, okay? So uh, for example, in, in, the, in the future, if you discover something, maybe you can name it uh, however you want to name it, okay? For example, let's say if Dr. Fidel um, comes up with a channel, maybe he can call it push-up channel, right? <clears throat> so that's that. So that's basically what it is. So funny channel, so funny sodium channel. So basically what, there is another small reason why we call, why uh, the scientist who said this was funny they, he basically, he or she basically named or termed the sodium channel as funny. It's because in pacemaker, you, we have the sodium channels that opens and closes at its own will. Okay. The, these channels, they open and close at, the, at their own will. And to this day, no one knows why. No one knows how. No one knows how. This is why the fact that we have funny sodium channels in our pacemaker, this is the reason why if you take a heart out of a human and you place it in a saline for five minutes, or if you keep on supplying blood, the heart will keep on pumping, despite the fact that the brain and the rest of the body is there or not. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? The fact that this is here, okay? The fact that this is here, this is sort of, a magical thing over here, or whether you say that this is a religious thing, or basically this is how God created the heart. That God created the heart with a funny sodium channel. As simple as that. We don't we're, we're not really aware of how and why this is happening. So this is the funny sodium channel. So, so the fact that we have these channels, this allows the sodium to sort of come in very quickly and it allows the resting membrane potential to, to rise all the way up to here. When it comes up to here, there's the beginning of another channel. There's a beginning of another channel. This channel causes a sudden upstroke like this, okay? There's, there's a sudden upstroke like this. The reason why there's a sudden upstroke like this in this channel, this, this is the phase zero because there is opening of calcium, okay? There is the opening of the calcium channel. When the calcium channel opens, there's a sudden influx of calcium. Once again, calcium induced calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This allows and prolongs the transmission of the impulse. And at this phase, there's a rapid fall all of a sudden. And please tell me which ion is responsible for this rapid fall. Very good. This rapid fall is due to potassium. Phase three is due to Potassium. So where did phase one and phase two go? Where is, where is phase one and phase two? Okay. Phase one and phase two are not here. Can anyone tell me why? Okay. The answer is very simple. Because the scientist who came up with this um, description, he decided to, he or she decided to keep the phase one and phase two out. As simple as that. Okay. He could have easily named this phase one, phase two, and phase three. But he thought he, you know, like how people, they want to be different in life, right? No one wants to be similar to all, to other people. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, there was another guy who came up with the action potential of the ventricular muscle. And this guy who came up with the action potential of the pacemaker, he decided to be different from the other guy. And he said, okay, instead, 
of naming this phase one, two, three, I'm going to name this phase four, zero, three. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so hopefully, inshallah, in the future, when we decide to do something and when we decide to figure something out, we can name or do anything however we please. Okay, so that's that. This is all you need to know. That's all. Are we clear? Okay, now, quick question. Why is this important? Why do we have to know ventricular action potentials, pacemaker action potentials? Why do we have to know this? Is it because they will be affected by drugs or is it because they will be affected by disease? Do you remember at the beginning, I said every physiology is important that will be affected by two Ds. One is a disease, another one is a drug. In this case, drugs will affect this. A lot of different types of drugs, especially antiarrhythmic drugs will play a huge role in pacemaker action potential. Okay, so one more time, let's talk about the ventricular action potential. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Okay, ventricular action potential number one is the resting, the resting uh, potential is negative 85. All of a sudden, the heart decides to pump the blood out, right? Under the influence of uh, oxygen supply and blood supply and electrical stimulation. So phase zero starts, sodium channel opens, sodium enters, rapid upstroke, sodium closes, potassium opens, then the potassium leaves and there's a, there's a downfall. At this point, potassium and calcium are open at the same time. So there, one is entering and another one is leaving. Which one is entering? Calcium enters and potassium leaves. And these two cancel each other out. As a result, what happens? As a result, they stay in a plateau stage. At this region, the calcium channels close and the potassium channels, they remain open. So all the potassium leaves and they keep on leaving, leaving, leaving until at one point, the amount of potassium inside the cell and outside the cell are same. So they plateau again at this one. And this is a one single contraction of the ventricle. That's one. Number two, pacemaker action potential. What is pacemaker action potential? The heart has the ability to create its own electric current. Okay, so we have a phase four called funny channels that opens and closes at its own will. Right, just as how things are made in the universe at God's will, we have the opening and closing of the funny sodium channels at their own will. So they open and close at their own will, and then the sodium enters, there's a, and there's a rapid upstroke. At this point, the funny sodium channels they sort of close. The calcium channels open. There's further increase of calcium entry. At this point, calcium closes and potassium opens, and potassium leaves. And there's a rapid downfall. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Why is the plateau stage important? The plateau stage is important because at this stage, it allows the heart to relax. And then at the repolarizing phase, it allows the heart to relax more, to fill up with blood so that you can, you, it can contract. Why is there no plateau over here? Do you realize if there was a plateau in the pacemaker action potential, is there, isn't there a possibility the heart would stop beating? Yes or no? because the heart is dependent on this. So that's that. Okay, are we clear everyone? Yes or no? Okay, so that's basically what it is. Okay, you have another homework. The homework is read this. Read this and read this. Very simple. Okay. Now, are you going to receive questions directly from this physiology? Yes or no? The answer is no. How are we? How are you going to receive questions from this physiology? And uh, basically, how will you answer questions? You need to understand this physiology to answer questions regarding drugs. Very simple. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Are we ready? Yes or no? E EKG or ECG, right? EKG or ECG, what is this? This is electrocardiogram. This is basically the conduction pathway. Um, over here, we have the SA node, the AV node, and that's that. Uh, let me tell you some of the high yield questions. First and foremost, SA node conduction will begin, will, will begin at SA node. Then they'll move all the way from, from the atria to the AV node. 
to the AV node, they'll go to the bundle of his. This is the bundle of his. From the bundle of his, they'll go to the right and left bundle for Akinji fibers and then to the ventricles, okay? So the thing is, you do not need to know, I mean, you have to know this, but it will not be tested. But this is a very general concept. If you do not know this, then it's frowned upon. That's as simple as that. So please try to remember this SA node, AV node, bundle of his, Parkinji fibers, left and red, left and right bundle branch, and then to the heart. Uh, there's a disease that will be associated with this conduction pathway. This, this disease is known as, can anyone, anyone, anyone tell me what is the disease associated with this pathway? This disease is known as, very simple, it is sarcoidosis, okay. Heart blocks, heart block. Very simple. First degree, second degree, hard block, right? Morbid's type one, type two, hard block, that's that. Third degree, AV block, and these are some other things. Basically, if the conduction system is not being able to conduct, for example, if SA node is not being able to conduct the electricity to the AV node, then isn't there a possibility that the SA node will contract by itself and the AV node will have to generate its own impulse? Yes, okay. So that's that. Now, what will be asked in your exam is the anatomical position, SA node. Where is it located? It's located at the, at the junction of the right atria and superior vena cava, over here. This is high yield. Location of the AV node, very important. It's located in the posterior inferior part of the interatrial septum. Posterior inferior, over here. Posteriorly, inferiorly, okay? AV node, please underline this, very high yield. Another question that you'll receive is speed of conduction. Which one has the highest speed? Basically, if anything has high speed, does that mean they have low resistance, yes or no? <clears throat> the answer is yes, okay? Yes, if anything has a very high speed, that means that the resistance is very low. So. In the his Parkinji, his Parkinji, the resistance is very low, so the speed is very high. They ask you this question. And then after his, you have atrias, then ventricles and AV nodes. So you have to remember the speed, which one is more speedy, as simple as that. So his Parkinji is more, and then uh, you have the ventricle, you have the uh, atria, then the ventricles. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay, now let's look at a normal EKG. In a normal EKG, what do we have? First of all, we have a P wave. This P wave, what does this indicate? The P wave is basically an indication of atrial depolarization. Keep in mind, you will not receive questions regarding what does the P wave indicate. You do not have to know this, but you have to know what EKGs are, because if you do not know how to read an EKG, you cannot uh, diagnose a patient's myocardial ischemia, arrhythmia, QT prolongation, torsades de points, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, and major, major, other major heart diseases, right? Heart blocks, yes, okay, so that's that. So P wave is for atrial depolarization. PR, after P wave, we have ventricular depolarization, that is QRS. This time from P to R is the time from the onset of atrial depolarization to the start of ventricular depolarization. depolarization. ER interval, if it increases, what does this mean? That if it increases, this means that the ventricle is taking time to depolarize. Yes or no? Fast answers, please. The answer is yes. What sort of drugs can increase the PR interval? Beta blockers. Okay, beta blockers will increase your PR interval. That's why if the ventricles, if they take time to depolarize, are they taking time to relax more? Yes or no? Are they taking more time to relax? Yes, okay, so that's what it is. Next one is QRS. QRS represents ventricular depolarization, okay? Ventricular depolarization. If we see a lot of QRS like this, does this indicate a lot of ventricular depolarization at the same time, yes or no? Yes, this means this is ventricular tachycardia. Yes, okay, but how about if we see half hazard things like this? Does this indicate tachycardia or fibrillation? This is <clears throat> fibrillation. 
Okay, as simple as that. Next one is QT interval. What is QT interval? QT interval is ventricular depolarization, right? The time from here to here. It, it, this is ventricular depolarization and the onset of ventricular repolarization. Now the QT interval is very high yield, okay? QT interval is very high yield. The thing is, if there is a prolongation of QT in interval, right? Because QT interval is representing your ventricular depolarization to ventricular repolarization, right? This phase. If the QT interval is very prolonged, then is the ventricle taking a long time to, con I mean, is the ventricle contracting for a long period of time? Yes or no? Yes. If the ventricles contract for a long period of time, right? For example, the ventricles, they're a muscle. If they contract for a long period of time, can there be uh, problems in the muscle like lactic acidosis and all of those types of issues? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So can you imagine the, your ventricles undergoing lactic acidosis? Will, will there be disruption of the normal pH of the ventricles? The answer is Yes, if there's disruption of the normal pH of the ventricles with prolonged ventricular depolarization and contraction, uh, will this disrupt the normal homeostatic balance of the ventricles, yes or no? The answer is yes. Next, if that disrupts the normal ventricular balance, isn't there a possibility that the ventricle will start freaking out? And we all know what happens when the ventricle starts freaking out. The ventricle starts contracting excessively. Yes or no? The answer is yes. The ventricles, they start contracting excessively. If the ventricles starts contracting excessively, do we call this ventricular tachycardia? Yes. And then after that, what happens? The ventricles, they will have asynchronous or abnormal contraction resulting in ventricular fibrillation. Yes or no? And if you do not control that, then the patients will have sudden cardiac arrest and then they will die. As simple as that. So. Prolongation of QT interval, is that good or bad? That's the question. This is bad. QT interval can get prolonged by a lot of different types of drugs. And there are some conditions where patients are actually born with a, with a condition called congenital, congenital long QT syndrome. Okay, does anyone know? Any name of a congenital disease where the QT syndrome is very high and where the QT interval is very high? Okay, very good. One with deafness, another one with not deafness. I'll talk about this. One disease is called Romano Ward syndrome, another, another disease is called Jarvel and Lange Nielsen disease or syndrome. Out of this one, one has sensory neural hearing loss, another one does not have sensory neural hearing loss. Can anyone tell me which one has sensory neural hearing loss with Jarvel and Lange Nielsen syndrome or Romano Ward syndrome? Okay. R. R4. R4. Romano. No deafness. Very good. Okay. So deafness is associated with with Jarvel and Lange Nielsen syndrome. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. So that's it. Next one is U wave. U wave, we do not usually see this. Only in patients who have hypokalemia can we see U wave. So whenever we see U wave, think of hypokalemia. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Yes, okay, good. So that's it. Let's talk about the next condition. Um, before I talk about the next condition, can you guys take two minutes to read the locations of the SA node and the AB node, yes or no? I'll ask you the location and then you can give me the answer.
Okay, is everyone done? Yes or no? Okay. What is the location of the SA node? What is the location of the AV node? Okay. Very good. Question here, interrupt your setup. Now let's begin with um, A and P's, B and P's. Okay. Let's begin. Are you guys understanding the lecture? Yes or no? Oh. Now, do you guys remember in the endocrinological uh, systems, we talked about the second messenger system, CGMP? And we say it, we said that the the uh, hormones they work with are not BAM, I think they are bad, right? BNP, ANP, and nitric oxide BAM, not bad, BAM. BNP, ANP, and nitric oxide. Okay. Are we clear? So let's begin. First and foremost, what's happening? What is ANP? What is atrial natriuretic peptide? Atrial natriuretic peptide is basically a hormone that is released from where? That is released from the atrius. How? When there is excessive stretching of the atrial muscles, when there is excessive stretching of the atrial muscles, the atrial myocytes, they, the atrial myocytes, meaning that the atrial uh, muscle cells, they release. ANP. ANP stands for atrial natriuretic peptide. What does ANP do? ANP, when they are released, they go and um, they decrease sodium reabsorption. Where? They decrease sodium reabsorption in the, in the kidney. Yes. In which portion of the kidney, especially in the collecting tubules. If they decrease sodium reabsorption, will more sodium stay inside the renal tubules? The answer is yes. If they stay more inside the renal tubules, then will they take in more water? The answer is yes. As a result, in, in increase to blood volume rise, do we get natriuresis? The answer is yes. Also, if there's excessive secretion of aldosterone, do we get increase of blood volume? The answer is yes. But this increase of blood volume will release the ANP. So the ANP will then decrease the blood volume by aldosterone, yes or no? What is this mechanism called? The fact that aldosterone cannot work properly, escape, very good. This is called aldosterone escape, very simple. ANP has some more functions, okay? The fact that they work by CGMP is very important for releasing sodium. Another thing is always remember, CGMP will always cause some sort of a constriction or contraction, CGMP they will cause some sort of a contraction or constriction. So the thing is that uh, the ANPs, they work by uh, CGMP. That CGMP, what they do is that they increase calcium entry inside the cells. Whenever calcium enters, they allow uh, 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 contractions to take place. Now, who is, con I mean, ANP is, contract is contracting which portion? ANP is, contract, is contracting your efferent renal arterioles. Why? For example, if this is the efferent arteriole, okay, and this is the glomerulus, and this is the efferent arteriole. If ANP constricts the efferent arteriole, and somewhat dilates the efferent arteriole, 
the filtration to the glomerulus? Will it be high or will it be low? It will be high. As a result, can they get rid of more sodium and water? The answer is yes. So did, it, did everyone understand the mechanism of action of atrial napiotic peptide, yes or no? Okay, same way we have the release of ventricular napiotic peptide. Okay, there's no, there's no such thing called ventricular napiotic peptide. This is called brain natriotic peptide. Can anyone tell me why it's called brain or B type natriotic peptide? Why is it released from the myocytes and the uh, ventricular myocyte? And it's called um, BNP. Very simple. It's called BNP because, you know, once again, the scientists, they, did, they decided that it, it would be funny to call the hormone as BNP instead of ventricular natural peptide. Okay, so please do not get confused when you hear brain natural peptide and you start thinking that it's released from the brain. It's not released from the brain, it's released from the ventricular myocytes. Okay. It's released from over here. How and why? Once again, they're released for the same reason. That is when there's excessive stretching of the ventricle under the influence of high blood volume, they release a high amount of BNP. Now the thing is, BNP is um, BNP is used, and BNP also does the same thing. It it prevents sodium reabsorption in the kidney. Okay, but BNP does not really affect the GFR as ANP does. You know, like how ANP will constrict the efferent and dilate the efferent. <laughs> BNP will not really do that. It will just uh, make sure that the sodium is not being absorbed. That's number one. But BNP has a, has a more important function. The most important function of BNP is that BNP is used as a diagnostic value. If uh, there's high BNP, this indicates that this patient has <clears throat> heart failure or fluid overload. So in heart failure, do we get, do we get uh, does the heart fail to contract? Yes or no? And get the blood out? The answer is yes. As a result, will more blood accumulate in the, in the ventricle? Yes or no? The answer is yes or no? The answer is yes. So if more blood accumulates in the ventricle, there's more stretching. If there's more stretching, then there's more release of the BNP. So, okay. So in, in a patient of heart failure, do you want to have more BNP or less BNP? Wrong. Okay, in a patient of heart failure, if there's more BNP, BNP will do what? BNP will get rid of the water. So if BNP is not there, will there be more water in heart failure? The answer is yes. So if there's more water, there will be further damage of the heart. So we want to get rid of water. We, we want to get rid of water. So that's why we will make sure that the BNP is more. How do we make sure that the BNP is more? BNP is broken down by an enzyme, right? And uh, we basically give a drug that prevents the breakdown of that enzyme. The name of that drug is called Neseritide. Uh, my, my apologies. The name of this drug is Sacubitril. Sacubitril. Have you guys ever heard of a combination of drugs called Sacubitril, Valsartan? A combination of a combination of angiotensin receptor blocker and a um, BNP enzyme inhibitor. BNP enzyme inhibitor. So. Can you repeat this? Okay. BNP is broken down by an enzyme into normal peptides. If we inhibit that enzyme, do we get more BNP or less BNP? Fast answers, please. We don't have a lot of time. Who do you want to do some questions? We get more BNP. That name of the drug is Sacubitril. Yes? Yes. Very good. Nephrolysin. Okay. 
I didn't want to mention the name because it's not important. Let to listen. Okay, that's the name of the enzyme, by the way. Cog succubitral is basically a nephrolysin inhibitor. There you go. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Gita, for sharing that with us. Is everyone clear about this? Yes or no? Also, we have another drug that is called neseritide. Neseritide. What is this drug? This drug is basically a BNP analog. That is, you're supplying BNP from outside. Okay, are we clear? Yes. Okay. Next one is let's talk about um, some things over here. Okay. Let's talk about cardiac autoregulation very quickly. Cardiac autoregulation. Okay, so cardiac autoregulation, let's talk about this. First and foremost, the cardiac muscles, the heart, the, there are some receptors that uh, will basically control the autoregulation. There are two types of receptors. One is dependent on pressure, for which we call this baroreceptor. Another one is, another one is dependent on the amount of, cardiac, of carbon dioxide and pH. So we call that chemoreceptors. If I have to say this very simply, that then the most simple thing that I can tell you is whenever we have activation of the baroreceptor and the chemoreceptor, both of them will initiate a very strong parasympathetic response. Vice versa, if they are less stimulated, will there be more parasympathetic or less parasympathetic? Less parasympathetic. If they're less parasympathetic, which one will, which action will be more in, in the presence of less parasympathetic action? Sympathetic action, as simple as that. So this is the way the normal balance of the heart is maintained without even us knowing what's going on, okay? Meaning how does the heart increase and decrease its activity? By, uh, meaning that how does it increase its, its, its heart rate? How does it increase its uh, force of contraction? That's how. Or decrease its heart rate and decrease its force of contraction. So now let's talk about this. Let's talk about the beta receptors first. Okay. So beta receptors, how many types of beta receptors do we have? Beta receptors are there in, um, I mean, the beta receptors and the chemoreceptors, they're there, they're located in two regions, number one. They're located, one is located in the aortic arch. Another one is located in the carotid sinus. In the carotid sinus, okay? So what happens? The thing that happens is if I have to draw a heart, okay, if I have to draw a heart like this, okay? Then over here, we have the ascending aorta. Then we have the arch. Wait one second. Then we have the arch of aorta. And then from the arch, we have brachiocephalic trunk, left common carotid, and left subclavian. From the brachiocephalic trunk, we have right common carotid and right subclavian. So this is one carotid, this is another carotid. Okay. Okay. So we have one better receptor over here, over here, and we have, I mean, we have one better receptor and chemo receptor over here, and we have one better receptor and chemo receptor in these two regions. Now, let's talk about, let's talk about um, this one. If the heart has hypertension. Okay, uh, just give me one second. Before we do this, let's talk about one more thing. Okay. Which one is a higher number? Uh, I mean, 
if I have to write this down, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Out of zero to 10, which one is more up? I mean, out of nine and 10, which one is more up? Obviously the answer is, how is, no, no, not, not down. Which one is located above the other one? Out of this, out of these two numbers, out of nine and 10, which one is located above which one? That's the correct way to ask the question. My apologies, it's my mistake. Okay, very good. So out of nine and 10, nine is above 10, as simple as that. So why is this important? This is important, this is important because nine is here, 10 is here, meaning that the cranial nerve, this one is the ninth cranial nerve, and this one is the 10th cranial nerve. Both of these cranial nerves are parasympathetic nerves. One is called glossopharyngeal, another one is your famous vagus. Okay, so the aortic arch bell receptor is, is, is associated with which cranial nerve? If that's your question, the answer is vagus. Very good. If the, if the, the carotid sinus uh, re receptors are associated with which cranial nerve? Fast answers, please. They're associated with? One more time. Uh, the aortic arch receptors are associated with which cranial nerve? Look at the diagram and give me the answer, please. Can I get some fast responses? Vegas. The carotid sinus receptors are associated with which cranial nerve? Ninth cranial nerve. Are you going to make this mistake again? If you are asked about this in your exam, yes or no? No. How and why? You know carotid is above the aortic arch. So obviously it's associated with a number that's above another number. And we know nine is above 10. So nine and 10. Okay. Now let's assume that there is a condition where we have um, hypertension or excessive blood. If we have hypertension and excessive blood, more blood is coming out. Will there be stretching of the bare receptors? Yes. If there's stretching of the bare receptors, both of the vagus nerves, will they fire? Well, I mean, both the vagus nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve, will they fire? The answer is yes. When they fire, there will be initiation of parasympathetic. And as a result, the, the thing that caused the hypertension, they will fall because the contraction will decrease, heart rate will decrease, and most importantly, there will be increased of AV node refractory period. What does this mean? AV node refractory period. AV node refractory period means that the AV node stays in a period of refraction where it does not transmit impulse to the bundle of his and the Purkinje. If it does not transmit impulse to the bundle of his and Purkinje and stays in refraction for a long period of time, Will there be more contraction or less contraction? There will be less contraction, as simple as that. If there's less contraction, then what happens? Then the force of contraction is less. As a result, less blood is, uh, is getting out and there's less stretching. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Simultaneously, can anyone explain how hypotension will increase the heart rate? How does hypotension increase heart rate? Anyone? Okay, no one wants to participate in active participation. No one wants to, um, no one wants to say any mechanisms. <clears throat> okay. If you do not practice the way of, if you do not practice the way of speaking and everything else, then this will be really, really difficult for you because you have to talk a lot in your periods of residency and everything else. Okay. So let me say this and, uh, for you guys. If there is hypotension, then what's happening? If there is hypotension, is there more stretching or less stretching? 
less stretching. If there's less stretching, will there be more sympathetic? Uh, I mean, more parasympathetic or less parasympathetic? If there's less parasympathetic, will there be more sympathetic? Very good. If there's more sympathetic in hypotension, will we have increase of heart rate and force of contraction? Okay, are we clear everyone, yes or no? Same way, one more time, okay? Same thing is the chemoreceptors, okay? Uh, the chemoreceptors, the thing is, if the chemoreceptors are dependent on pH and partial pressure of carbon dioxide, meaning that if there's increase of partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and uh, decrease of pH and decrease of decrease of partial pressure of oxygen. When does these things happen? If a ventricle is contracting for a long period of time due to hypertension or anything else, will it undergo more metabolism? Fast answers, please. We don't have a lot of time, yes or no? The answer is yes. If there's more metabolism, will there be more production of carbon dioxide of the ventricular muscles, yes or no? Yes. If there is uh, more carbon dioxide, what would happen to the pH? No. What would happen to the partial pressure of oxygen? Because they'll use up a lot of oxygen, they'll also be low. In this case, these three things, when they happen, can they activate the chemoreceptors? Yes or no? Can they activate the chemoreceptors? The answer is obviously yes. When they activate the chemoreceptors, the chemoreceptors are going to be activated. And when the chemoreceptors activated, especially over here in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus, will they activate the ninth and the 10th cranial nerve? The answer is yes. When they activate the ninth and the 10th cranial nerve, which one will work more, parasympathetic or sympathetic as a result? Parasympathetic will work more. If parasympathetic works more, will the heart rate decrease, force of contraction decrease? The answer is yes. When it decreases, the, the metabolism of the heart, will it decrease? The answer is yes. As a result, partial pressure of carbon dioxide will come down, become normal. When partial pressure of carbon dioxide comes down, what happens to the pH? pH gets normal. And is there more time for the cardiac muscles to receive more oxygen in, in a parasympathetic state? The answer is yes. Are we clear everyone, yes or no? Very simple. Okay, I wanna talk about another thing over here. Before I talk about this, who can explain, can I please get one physician who can explain their receptors and chemoreceptors one time, and then I can move forward. Can I ask someone at, at random? Can I ask Dr. Fidel, if you would be kind enough to explain what you have just learned, the receptors and chemoreceptors? I don't mean to put you on the spot. If you don't want to answer, just please say no. I will not mind, I'll move forward. Yes, do I have your attention, Dr. Fidel? Okay. Uh, how about Dr. Jorge Otero? Okay, pass off, no problem. Dr. Jorge Otero. Okay, their receptors. Please unmute yourself and tell me the answer so that everyone can hear and we can all understand. Hello. Yes. Yes. Um, in case of uh, hypotension, uh, we can say the arterial uh, blood pressure is decreased. So um, it will sense or fire uh, the various receptors and then the signal it will increase the sympathetic system and then nope. lower the parasympathetic. Uh, no, no. You are, you're talking about hypotension or hypertension? Hypo, hypotension. Hypo, oh, okay, then you're correct. Okay, please go on. Yeah. Uh-huh, so the efferent parasympathetic will decrease that stimulation and then it will create a vasoconstriction and it will the blood vessel and then it will cause increase of heart rate and contractility uh, continuously. So okay. that's uh, 
the case of hypotension, a blood loss, or any like uh, um, hemorrhage. Yeah. Uh, so, so this way the heart will reverse the hypotension to hypertension by Correct. sympathetic intervention by sympathetic the intervention. The receptors that uh, you know are located okay, at the very carch and carotid sinus. Okay, now let's ask you, what would happen if the heart is in a state of hypertension? It will be uh, the, um, I mean, reverse. I mean, reverse. Okay, very the good. Opposite. So, okay. so since you said the hypertension, let me ask you about hypertension. All you have to say is yes or no. Okay, Dr. Jorge, are you ready? Yes. Okay. In hypertension, do we get more stretching of the bare receptors and the chemoreceptors? In hypertension? Yes, in hypertension. Yes. Okay. When there's more stretching of the aortic receptors and the carotid sinus receptors, uh, do we have firing of the ninth and 10th cranial nerve? No. Yes, we do. When we have more stretching of the uh, receptors, we get firing of the cranial nerves. Yes? Okay. okay. The, ninth and the ninth and 10th cranial nerve, they, they will fire. When they fire, what would happen? Uh, would we have a sympathetic or a parasympathetic? It will be the parasympathetic. Very good. So in hypertension, a, as a result of increased blood flow, the aortic receptors and the carotid receptors will fire and there will be increase of parasympathetic. As a result, this parasympathetic will go from the ninth and the 10th the to the medulla, to the spinal cord, and then it'll come back with the vagus nerve and they will decrease the heart rate yes or no yes if they decrease the heart rate the hypertension will it get fixed somewhat yes or no yes the answer is yes okay so this is how in hypertension the heart gets parasympathetic uh, parasympathetic in hypotension according to your explanation and first stage explanation the heart gets sympathetic perfect. are you clear yes clear perfect if dr jorge is clear then that must mean that every one of us should also be clear yes or no Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for helping us out. We really appreciate your help. Um, the, now, the thing is, I want to talk about this one. I want to talk about coaching reflex. Okay. Now, please keep your concentration for this one because coaching reflex is extremely high yield. What is coaching reflex? Cushing's reflex is basically a triangle, a triad of three things. Number one, hypertension, hyper, okay? High blood pressure, hypertension. Bradycardia, meaning decrease of heart rate and respiratory depression, okay? Why do these three things happen all of a sudden? This is very common. In your clinical setting as a physician in the ER, if any patient comes to you, the first thing that we see is ABCDs. And then we check for the vital signs. In the vital signs, if you get a blood pressure of 180 by 100, and if you see that the heart rate is 50 and the respiratory rate is 12, then you need to understand that this patient of yours is undergoing Cushing's reflex. Why? Because whenever you have increased uh, pressure in the brain, okay, whenever you have increased pressure, increased intracranial pressure, for whatever reason, this could be due to hemorrhage, this could be due to a tumor, this could be due to an obstruction of the um, of the of the, of the flow of the central of the, of the cerebrospinal fluid. For whatever reason, if there's a high intracranial pressure in the brain, will this constrict the blood vessels or will this uh, dilate the blood vessels? The answer is high intracranial pressure will constrict the blood vessels. They will constrict the blood vessels. When the blood vessels get constricted, does partial pressure of carbon dioxide increase? Yes or no? The answer is yes. How? For example, if this is a cell, if the blood vessels constrict, are you going to have blood flow to the cell? No. 
if you do not get blood flow <laughs> to, to the cell, what would happen to the oxygen to inside the cell? Will, will it decrease or increase? Decrease. If it decreases, what type of metabolism will happen in the cell? Arabic or anaerobic? Anaerobic. If there's anaerobic metabolism, will this create lactic acid? Yes. If lactic acid is produced, will this increase the pH or decrease the pH? Decrease the pH. Then what else? If the oxygen is also low, will the carbon dioxide be high? The carbon dioxide is high. So what's happening inside the cell? Partial pressure of carbon dioxide is increasing. pH is decreasing. And we all know what happens when partial pressure of carbon dioxide increases, pH decreases, and oxygen decreases. We have the firing of which, re which receptor? The chemoreceptors they will fire. When they fire, right? When they fire, what happens? When they fire, we get a parasympathetic response, yes or no? This parasympathetic response is responsible for your bradycardia and they're responsible for your respiratory depression. But should, uh, and also the, uh, the patient, they should also get hypotension if instead of uh, hypertension, yes or no, in parasympathetic, yes or no, yes. But the reason why, the reason why parasympathetic innervation can only decrease heart rate and the respiratory rate and not the blood vessel is because the brain at the same time also secretes or creates a sympathetic innervation and we know sympathetic innervation is very strongly um, focused on the blood vessels because the blood vessels have a lot of alpha receptors. So in case of this chemoreceptor firing and decreasing your heart rate and respiratory rate, it fails, the parasympathetic innervation fails to decrease your blood pressure. Why? Because of the fact that the brain tries to also secrete a lot of sympathetic response. So uh, that sympathetic response will keep the blood pressure high, but it cannot keep the heart rate and respiratory rate high, but it can keep the blood pressure high because of the alpha-1 activity. Parasympathetic receptor, on the other hand, do not have uh, any I mean, they're not very potent on the blood vessels, but they are potent on the heart rate. So that's why in case of a Cushing's reflex, we get a constellation of hypertension, bradycardia, and respiratory depression. Is everyone clear, yes or no? Okay, no, that was a big one. Homework, read this at home, entire physiology at home and come to me tomorrow with questions. Are we clear? Okay. Okay, let's move forward. Is everyone ready for the normal cardiac pressures? Normal cardiac pressures. So far we are done with autoregulation. So far we are done with, um, what else? We're done with cardiac action potentials. Now let's talk about uh, the pressures in different chambers of the heart. Okay. Let's talk about the pressures in the different chambers of the heart. We have, we have four chambers, so four different types of pressure. Number, number one is the right atrial pressure. Right atrial pressure is going to be less than five. Right ventricular pressure, as you can see, is 25 over five. Okay, that's it. How do we measure the pressure? We measure the pressure with the help of a cardiac manometer. Okay, we measure the pressure with the help of a cardiac manometer. We we insert the cardiac manometer. It's a wire-like manometer. We insert it 
through the vena system and it goes all the way up to the superior vena cava and then to the right atrium. And then we measure the pressure in the right atrium. It can also go to the right ventricle and we can measure the pressure in the right ventricle. In case of a patient who has a right atrial pressure of more than five, let's say 15, does this indicate right ventricular failure? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Can this also indicate tricuspid stenosis? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. So that, that, that. Okay. What about the pressure in the left atrium? The left atrium pressure is uh, just more, just exactly the, the, I mean, exactly double the pressure of right atrium. So if the right atrium is five, the left atrium is 10. Okay. Over here, it says 12, but that's okay. You, if you can remember 10, that's enough. So 10. It, it, it should be 10, so 10 to 12 is basically. And this one, the left ventricular pressure is our normal blood pressure. That is 120 over 80. Um, my apologies, 120 over uh, 10 because the diastolic pressure is less. And then the ascending pressure is 120 over 80. Is everyone clear, yes or no? Okay. Do you guys remember that I talked about a, a type of catheter that we enter into the vein and then we measure the blood pressure? I mean, we, we measure the pressures in the chambers. Yes. That uh, manometer is called a swan gans catheter. Okay. Next one. For step one, that it's very high yield that you understand that there's only one pressure that we like to measure. That pressure is known as pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, PCWP. And pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is a direct indication of left atrial pressure. Please remember this. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. So do you, uh, do you have to remember the pressures of different chambers of the heart? The answer is yes. But I'm still writing blue because they did not directly ask you this question, but it's something which I personally want you guys to remember this. Okay? This will help you. Okay, so that's that. Next one is, uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk about this one first and this one next. Before I talk about these two things and end the lecture, do you guys wanna take another five minute break and clear your heads? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. After that, we'll be done with physiology. So let's take a five minute break and um, let's talk about the last two things and let's close the lecture with this. Okay. So it's 12.54. I'll, st I'll start the class once again at 1 p.m. Okay. So let's take a five minute break. Okay. Dr. Fidel, you know what to do. Right? Do we have Dr. Fidel? Okay. Some more. Some more push-ups for Dr. Fidel. Okay. In the next five minutes, try to make sure that you have the blood flow going to your brain because you're going to need it. And so everyone, so does everyone else. So let's take that five minute break and then let's come back. Thank you so much.
Okay, uh, is everyone back? Is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Are you guys stressed out about uh, all the information that you have learned today in the short amount of time? I don't know. I mean, the reason why I'm asking this is because I sense a little bit of confusion. I sense a little bit of hesitancy. I sense that you guys are not 100% sure about the information. Is that what it is? Yeah. Or um, have you learned the information, but you're not sure if you will remember it? Which one? Can we get some feedbacks, please? Hey, Dr. Ellen, what do you think about this? Okay. Dr. Nazar, what do you think about this? What do you think about the fact about all the information that you have learned today? But are you clear? Okay. Let me rephrase the question. Have you guys understood all the information that we have given you today? Yes or no? Okay, good. Now, if you guys understood what I have said, then if you guys are confused, then there are two things you can do. First, of, first and foremost, read the book or read the chapter one more time or read the books one more time. Number one. Number two, watch the video one more time. Will you guys get recordings for the video? The answer is yes. So if you're not sure of anything, either you can watch the video for the second time. Third, third is if you really do not understand after reading and watching the video, then you can always ask us in the class and we will repeat the information. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. So if you do one, two, three, then do you have anything to worry about? The answer is. Okay. So nice and calm. Let's finish cardiac physiology. Let's talk about capillary fluid exchange. Very easy and very, very important. Capillary fluid exchange. Okay, Dr. Fidel, you said that it's been a while since you passed or since you graduated. That's completely understandable and it's completely normal. Uh, we're right over here. If you have any issues with understanding any concept, please let us know. We will beat ourselves. Okay, so do not worry. Just keep up the good work, keep up the fact, keep up the um, revision and recapitulation. What about auto regulation? Auto regulation, I'll talk about capillary fluid exchange. Okay. Are we clear? Okay. Dr. Ethar also, 10 years. Okay, so no worries. Same thing, read the text, listen to the videos. If you have issues, if you don't understand anything, please bring it up in the class and we will talk again about the topics that you do not understand. No problem. Are we ready or not? Okay, so we're going to talk about capillary fluid exchange. Okay, we'll talk about capillary fluid exchange. What does this mean? This basically means how is the fluid, right? This basically means how is the fluid coming out or coming in of a tube? What sort of a tube do we have in our, in our system? Very simple question. What sort of a tube do we have in our system? The, or the, on the tubes that we have in our system are blood vessels. There you go. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me just draw this. Okay, so let's say that this is a blood vessel. So we need to calculate how fluid is coming out and we need to calculate how fluid is coming in. For example, if a lot of fluid comes out, what is that state called? That state is called edema, right? If a lot of, if a lot of fluid goes back 
inside the blood vessels, then what happens? Then blood volume increases, hypertension happens, and all of those things. The question is, why does it happen? And how do we understand this? That's the question. The answer is very simple. Number one is that we, when we were studying science, we talked about and we learned about osmosis, right? What is osmosis? Osmosis is basically the movement of fluid from where to where. The movement of fluid from the high concentration of fluid to a space where there is low concentration of fluid. That's one way to say this. Or can we also say that, that osmosis is the movement of fluid from low concentration of solutes to high concentration of solutes? Yes or no? Right? Because solutes are osmotically active particles. So, where, so wherever there is high solute, that must mean that there is low water. Whenever there is low solute, that must mean that there is high water, at least in, in terms of tubes, as something like that. Okay, so over here, this is the blood vessel and this is the interstitium. Okay, this is the interstitium. For first aid, we use this one. That is for um, blood vessels, we use the word, um, I mean, my, my apologies. We have two types of pressure. One is a water pressure or hydrostatic pressure for use for which we use the word P, capital P. Another word is a osmotic pressure or the colloidic pressure or the plasma oncotic pressure. However, you want to say this. For that, we use the word pi. So one more time. When do we use the word P? We use it for hydrostatic pressure, pi, we use it for oncotic pressure, okay? So if this is your blood vessel, right? If this is the blood vessel, so that must mean that in the blood vessel, you have two things. You have water and you have solutes. So the water will be represented by P, and C for capillaries or blood vessels. And pi is for the amount of solute. So one is a representation of the amount of water, one is a representation of the amount of salt or solutes. Outside, we have, do we have water outside? The answer is yes. So outside, we will say PI or interstitial hydrostatic pressure and pi i for interstitial oncotic pressure. Okay. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Yes. Blood vessels, do they have pores or channels or ways by which water can leave easily? Yes. The answer is yes. Okay. Question is, do solutes move through this pores? Yes or no? Solutes, do they move through this pores? No. But water, do they move through this pores? The answer is yes, right? Very simple. So before I jump into any other conclusion, let's start talking about each type of pressure and the way they work. If I talk about hydrostatic pressure inside the capillaries, are they going to are they going to try to work to push the water out? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Why? Because if the water flow, the pressure of water is high, then water will come out more easily. As simple as that. So that's why hydrostatic pressure will always try to will always try to push the water out. Oncotic pressure is the pressure of the solutes. Will they always try to hold the water, absorb the water like salt? The answer is yes. They'll try to absorb the water to this way. Okay. Same way, vice versa. Interstitial pressure. 
interstitial hydrostatic pressure? Will it try to push the water into the blood vessel? Yes or no? The answer is yes. And oncotic pressure, will it try to pull the fluid from the blood vessel outside into the interstitium? The answer is yes. Okay. So if we want to calculate the net fluid movement, okay, if we want to calculate the net fluid movement, what do we do? Can we simply um, add all the pressure that are working in similar direction? For example, let's just um, add the pressure that are working in this direction, okay? Let's add the pressure that are working in this direction. Or let's say that um, we do this, okay? Just give me one second. Let me write this, net fluid pressure, NFP, okay? Now, my next question is, can you subtract hydrostatic pressure with oncotic pressure? The answer is no, why? Because oncotic pressure can only be subtracted from the oncotic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure, can they be subtracted from hydrostatic pressure? The answer is yes, okay? Because these pressures, they work similarly. So over here, um, this hydrostatic pressure is working this way. And this hydrostatic pressure is working this way, right? We know that the hydrostatic pressure inside the blood vessel is usually more than the hydrostatic pressure outside the blood vessel. So which value should be higher, PC or PI? Fast chances, please. PC, very good. So let's subtract the net hydrostatic pressure first. That is PC minus PI. And from this, can we subtract the oncotic pressure? For example, the oncotic pressure, they are trying, this oncotic pressure is trying to pull the water in. This oncotic pressure is trying to pull the water out. Oncotic pressure also inside the blood vessel is higher than the oncotic pressure outside the blood vessel. So in order to calculate this, can we write pi C minus pi I? Yes or no? The answer is yes. As a result, what would happen? When we subtract the pressure that is being provided by this one, interstitial pressure, because they're preventing the water to get out and this pressure is trying to get the water out. So when they cancel each, each other out, we'll get a small value, which is going to give us a value with which the pressure is trying to leave. And this will give us a value that this is the pressure that is trying to hold the water. So only if you subtract the pressure, which is trying to hold the water, can you calculate the net water that will actually come out of the blood vessel? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? So in simple terms, hydrostatic pressure has to be subtracted. Uh, I mean, the oncotic pressure has to be subtracted from the hydrostatic pressure. The hydrostatic pressure is found by the net hydrostatic pressure that is subtracting the interstitial hydrostatic pressure with the capillary hydrostatic pressure. And then you'll get a net hydrostatic pressure. And that's how we get the total fluid movement in which direction? this direction or this direction? Fast answers, please. Very good. In the direction of B. Is everyone clear? Yes or no? Outwards, yes. Okay. Now, if there is a patient who has a high amount of capillary hydrostatic pressure, will the value of B increase or decrease?
Very good. If anyone has a high amount of plasma on cortic pressure, will the value of B increase or decrease? Decrease, very good. If anyone has a high amount of interstitial hydrostatic pressure, will the value of B increase or decrease? Decrease, very good. If anyone has a high amount of um, interstitial oncotic pressure, will the value of B increase or decrease? Increase, very good. Because B is trying to move this way and oncotic pressure is also trying to pull this way. So these are similar direction. As a result, the pressure is going to increase. So what are some conditions where capillary pressure increases? where hydrostatic pressure increases. Can the hydrostatic pressure increase in heart failure? The answer is yes. Can they increase in hypertension? The answer is yes. Can they increase in fluid administration? The answer is yes. yes. What are some conditions where oncotic pressure will increase? Can this be due to increased salt intake? Yes or no? Yes, increase salt, okay. Renal failure, yes or no? Okay, so that's that. Next one is, if the, if the oncotic pressure decreases, what will happen to B? Will it increase or decrease? Meaning net fluid movement in this way. If net fluid movement in this way, if oncotic pressure is decreased, will B decrease? Yes or no? The, the net fluid movement, will it decrease or increase? It will decrease. Why will it decrease? Oncotic pressure is trying to keep the water inside the blood vessel. If oncotic pressure decreases, then the pressure with which they try to keep the blood inside the blood vessel also decreases. As a result, will more fluid get out of the blood vessels, yes or no? So one more time, let me ask you this question and please give me the right answer and think, please think before you answer. If oncotic pressure, this pressure, if it decreases, what would happen to the net fluid movement? Will it be high or will it be low? It will be high, very good, okay? Next one is, um, what are some conditions where oncotic pressure decreases? Oncotic pressure decreases when the production of plasma protein decreases, yes or no? Pass chances, please. For example, in nephrotic syndrome, plasma protein is lost to the urine. In liver failure, plasma protein is not being synthesized. In protein malnutrition, plasma protein is decreased. Okay. So, in these conditions, fluid will move more outside or fluid will stay inside. Fast answers. Very good. Fluid will move outside. Okay. Fluid will move outside because the pressure that they are trying to use to keep the blood in or the fluid in, that pressure is decreasing, okay? Are we clear, yes or no? Okay, let's talk about something else very quickly. Okay. Let's talk about four friends, okay? So let's talk about four friends. Okay, give me one second, Dr. S. Let me finish my discussion first, then I'll answer your question. Thank you so much. Okay, let's let's talk about four friends. This friend is called A, this is B, this is C, and this is D. Friend A tries to cross to this side. Friend B will the friend B does not want friend A to cross this side. Friend B will stop him. 
Similarly, friend C also wants to cross this side, but friend D will prevent friend C. Did we understand the work of the four friends? Fast answers, please. We don't have a lot of time. Yes, okay. very simple. The goal is, what is the goal? The goal is to make sure that friend A cross or doesn't cross, whichever, depending on the situation. When will friend A cross to this side? Friend A will cross to this side if friend B, if friend B's power decreases, yes or no? For example, if, if friend B cannot prevent friend A from staying over here, can friend A easily leave the place from here to here? Fast answers, please. Very simple. Oh, as simple as that. Now, when friend A comes to this side, right? Friend C, will, will friend C prevent friend A from coming to this side? Yes or no? Because he also wants to go to that side. The answer is yes, right? Friend C will prevent friend A from coming to this side. But out of C and D, who will help friend A to cross, to, to cross over to this side? D, right? Because he also wants people to stay on this side. So he wants friend A to come. Similarly, if I tell you that this is a blood vessel and there's a pressure inside the blood vessel that wants to come out, there's a pressure inside the blood vessel that wants to prevent the blood from coming out, right? This pressure is this pressure. And on this side, there is a pressure which wants to go in and there's a pressure that wants to stay here. So if blood, I mean, if fluid has to leak out, does it have to overcome this pressure and this pressure? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So if this pressure is low, is it easy for this pressure to get out? The answer is yes. Vice versa, if this pressure is also low, can this pressure easily get out? The answer is yes. So inside the blood vessel, if the oncotic pressure falls in case of nephrotic syndrome, liver cirrhosis, malnutrition, will there be leak, leakage of fluid into the extracellular space? The answer is yes. If there is increase of hydrostatic pressure in the blood vessel, will there be leakage of fluid into the extracellular space? Fast answers, please. Yes or no? Yes? Okay. okay. Um, if there is increase of this pressure, will there be more leakage or less leakage? Send me this word, then I'll answer your question. If this pressure increases, will this pressure will this fluid get out more easily? Yes or no? Thank you so much for saying yes, because once again they are working in the same direction. Okay, this should not be so difficult to understand. Please keep your concentration. Okay. Um, how about this one? If this one increases, what would happen to the pressure with which the fluid will come out? Will it be high or will it be low? Okay. Please. 
try to read this at home one more time. If you do not understand this, then I'll explain it to you guys tomorrow. Uh, we had another question from a student who said that what would happen with the lymphatic blockage? If there's a blockage of lymphatic, the fluid, interstitial fluid, interstitial osmotic pressure, this pressure will increase. If this pressure increases, what would happen to the fluid movement? Will it be this way, A, or this way, B? Same question again. If interstitial oncotic pressure increases, which way will the fluid move, please? Yes, very good, A. Once again, why? Because they're working in the same direction. That's all. Okay, so does that answer your question, Dr. Ethar, yes or no? Okay, good. So that's all about net fluid pressure and capillary fluid exchange. Please try to read this at home today and uh, we will, talk about this tomorrow. Very quickly, I just wanna talk about some things and then we'll end the lecture. There are some factors that will determine the heart regulation or heart auto, I mean, not heart, auto regulation, not only in heart. So for heart, number one, the factors that determines whether the flow of blood is going to be high or going, is it going to be low, depends on some things. For example, nitric oxide. If nitric oxide is there, there's more vasodilatation. So blood flow is going to be high. Carbon dioxide. If carbon dioxide is less, right? Then that, then, uh, I mean, if, if carbon dioxide is more, then that means that the heart is not getting enough blood. So the blood flow will try to increase. If oxygen is less, then that means that the blood flow is not enough. So auto-regulation will try to increase the blood to the heart. Are we clear about these factors? Yes or no? Nitric oxide increases, blood flow increases. Carbon dioxide increases, blood flow increases. Oxygen decreases, blood flow increases. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. In the brain. Okay. In the brain. The uh, metabolite is only one that will autoregulate. This metabolite is carbon dioxide. Okay. In the kidney, we have something that we call as um, myogenic and tubular glomerular feedback mechanism. I'll talk, I'll talk about this one later. Myogenic and tubular glomerular feedback. I'll talk about this one later. Okay. Lungs. In the lungs, autoregulation is maintained by whether the patients have vasoconstrictions or not. The thing is, I'll talk about this in respiratory system. That is when one portion of the lungs are not getting enough oxygen, they undergo vasoconstriction because they want to make sure that blood flow is better in other areas of the lungs where ventilation is maintained so that oxygen uh, transfusion can happen more easily. So that's that. So in the lungs, hypoxia or decrease of oxygen will cause vasoconstriction. Uh, skeletal muscle, number five. Skeletal muscle is dependent on a lot of things, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, lactate, a little bit of potassium, that's that. And skin is dependent on temperature. As simple as that. Now, do not get overwhelmed. For now, only remember this. For the cardiovascular system, we only have to remember these three factors. The rest, I'll talk about them when I'll come to each and every organ system. I'll describe the mechanisms. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay, so last question for today. What are the three metabolites that are responsible for cardiac autoregulation? <laughs> Fast answers, please. What are the th uh, three metabolites that are responsible for cardiac autoregulation? Yeah. Very good. Just remember this for now. The rest I'll explain later. And uh, with that being said, we are done with cardiac physiology. And we're also done with the class. Today, since we use a lot of our brain, we will not be doing any more questions. We'll do more questions tomorrow. Today, you guys have, a, you guys have only one homework. Uh, my apologies, two homework. Number one, read 
in the first aid physiology, CVS. If you have questions, bring it up in the class tomorrow. Next, U world questions. How many? 20 to 40. From where? CVS and endocrine. Okay, if anyone is more hardworking than one and two, you have more time, please read CVS or watch. All you have to do is lie in your bed and watch CVS and endocrine Beth, endocrine Bethoma videos. These are your three homeworks. Complete them. Let us know if you have any issues and difficulties. Are we clear? Does anyone have questions? All right. Dr. Jorge Otero, yes, I should have thought about that. Number one is before you do anything else, first and foremost, listen to hard promise <clears throat> on YouTube. Then read first aid, then U World, and then Patola. Okay, are we clear? Okay. So with that being said, thank you so much for joining the class. Hope you guys have a great day. Complete your homework. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. If you guys have any questions, send us an email. Uh, wait one second. Um, have you guys joined this group yet? The Facebook discussion group? Have you guys joined the Facebook discussion group? Yes or no? Join the discussion group, the old one. Yes, the old one. You will get the links over here in the future. Join the group right away. Do we need to download recordings? You can download recordings if you want. If you think you should, you can. I'll send you the recordings in your email, okay? I'll send you the recordings in your email. Are we clear, yes or no? Uh, do we have Dr. Ethar with us today? Okay. Do you see your name anywhere over here? Anyone? Okay. Okay. If you guys are hearing the recording then please send us an invitation to join this group we will be uploading the lecture links over here in the future so that's it okay thank you so much hope you guys have a great day that's all for today i'll see you guys tomorrow at 9 30. make sure to complete your homeworks and wishing everyone a very very good day today okay bye-bye now